Hey there, Rick, how are you? Awesome, I mean, what's not awesome these days? I know, and I really liked th today's music, and so we should thank Heather and her husband, Baba Brinkman, for the selection. We know that there's usually people that join us um, slightly before the top of the hour, and we are very grateful to Heather for influencing her husband to allow us to play that music um, for our welcoming slide deck. So welcome to all of you, and I hope you were, were enjoying that for those of you who came early. My my name is Anne Merchant and I work for the National Academy of Sciences and of course I am as always joined by Rick Lovard. I'm the program director of the Science and Entertainment Exchange which is a program of the National Academy of Sciences and by the way I think we're going to throw a link up uh, to Baba's music if you're interested in learning more about Baba Brinkman. Terrific. Thank you very much uh, again, Heather and Baba for that. And we are really glad that you are here with us. Once again, we've been doing um, our virtual events weekly-ish, mostly weekly, um, since April 1st of last year. And we're really glad that a lot of you continue to join us for this. And we we will keep putting our weekly programs together. Um, and as always, I will start by um, some of you probably could do this for me by now. But of course, the National Academy of Sciences is a program uh, that was or a an institution that was created by Abraham Lincoln in 1863. Um, and of course, the idea was that if there was an institution that sat outside the formal framework of the, the federal government, that that was the best way to be able to use independent advice to steer a good course using the, the independent expert advice that came um, from scientists. And of course, we are at the National Academy of Sciences is joined by the National Academy of Engineering and the National Academy of Medicine, the two sister institutions that came later. And um, we we actually went down, there's a, some of you know that on Constitution Avenue, where our historic building sits, there is a pretty famous statue of, a of um, uh, Albert Einstein. And uh, I and my colleagues, we haven't seen each other in person since last March, but we masked up and we masked up Albert Einstein's statue. We put a mask on him. And so that was actually fun to see each other briefly and to, to put a mask on, on Einstein. So hashtag- And that's a great up. place to get a selfie. That's it is. I was going to say, selfie. if you're local to DC, hashtag masked up, mask up with, um, with Einstein. Einstein. But of course, the, the program that Rick directs is um, uh, a program of the National Academy of, of Sciences. And I did want to say that we have a few things that were um, happening at the Academy this week. Um, one, there was a new report that came out on accelerating our path to net zero carbon emissions. That's on our website. And you can find that. I, I think that the path is to 2050 to make us um, uh, net zero carbon neutral. So that's a big and important report. The other thing is that there was new guidance for um, public health officials on how to make people more comfortable with receiving their COVID vaccines. And of course, that's increasingly important that we get those messages out there. And related to that, there were 60 Black National Academy of Medicine members who penned uh, an editorial for the New York Times that really looked at the importance for Black men and women in this country to receive their COVID vaccines because it's those communities of color that are especially hesitant. So we're really um, looking at ways to get those messages and those messengers out there. So. Um, this is, of course, a lot of the important work that the Academy is focused on. Um, but, uh, you know, the, the exchange is doing its part as well, and uh, these event series are part of that. So I'm going to hand it over to you, Rick, to talk a little bit about the exchange. Oh, you muted yourself. Oh, no. I know. <laughs> this worst. is your moment. <laughs> I was, my two-year-old son was making uh, airplane noises in the hallway, so I had to, you know. Um, so if, <laughs> the Science and Entertainment Exchange is a program of the National Academy of Sciences. Um, and if you are a writer, producer, studio executive, and you're making a piece of media, including documentaries, by the way, <laughs> TV, film, book, video game, you have a question about science, you can call us and we will connect you with someone who can answer your uh, question and put it in the context of your story for free. Uh, we've done over 300 events uh, since we launched in 2008 and uh, over 3,300 consults, including Avengers Infinity War, Man of Steel, Black Panther, Captain Marvel, Songbird. So if you're a STEM professional and you're just tuning in, 
Um, you know, so many of you have actually, through this online event series, found out about these consults and volunteered, and thank you. Uh, we, we are always looking for more people to connect with uh, storytellers. Um, so, oh, and I think I put up the number 844-NEED-SIGH. Uh, there it is right there. So if you want to contact us, that's our contact information. Uh, so I want to thank Ameche from our AV team, Jeff uh, Fishman from our, our team in DC, Sachi Gerben here in LA, and uh, also our sponsors, Howard Hughes Medical Institute, who sponsors this whole event series. So it's the reason we're here today. Also the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation, Walt Disney Company, Film Nation, Google, Lida Hill, Corteva, and so many of you who have become supporters of the program and donors yeah. since we started this. It's just been unbelievable to get so many people um, with an interest in the program and an interest in supporting us directly. Um, if you have um, uh, supported us at the actual supporter level, um, our 2021 coins as a thank you uh, will be out hopefully in another few weeks. Uh, the order is supposed to be getting to me in three weeks. Um, also, uh, so about today specifically, the event starts today, um, if you have a question while Heather is speaking, you can put it down or up if you're on an iPad. Um, there's a little Q&A bubble, you click that, you can ask your question, and we're gonna get to as many of them as we can. I'm actually gonna be reading them to Heather in the Q&A section of today's program. We'll get to as many as possible. Uh, we've got about 20 minutes, so we'll just get through as many as we possibly can. If we don't get to your question, I'm sorry. And if you, uh, there's a separate ticket class for a video Q&A right after this. If you signed up for that ticket, or if you are a supporter, uh, which gets you a year of those VIP Q&A sessions, um, then you should have been sent a link. Um, if you weren't sent a link, please contact Sachi at the uh, email address in the, in the little feed uh, in the, the chat here. And uh, sh we will make sure to send you a link. Um, and there you go. So that'll be a separate link at the end of the, at the end of the program. That's all I got. That's all you got. All right. Well, of course, before we get to our formal program, we have made it a habit to do our little rabbit hole moment. And I don't, I'm sure many of you have heard of this, but I am obsessed with the cat lawyer. And I, I've watched this so many times. I can't tell you, but the fact that somebody is now on zoom and still hasn't completely figured out the filters and has to say, I'm not a cat. But I especially liked Margaret Atwood's Twitter response, which is, I th she had said, I, on the other hand, am a cat. I just can't figure out how to get this human filter off my Zoom. That's, a, a, I think, the perfect response to that. But the cat lawyer. <laughs> and for any of you who haven't seen the cat lawyer, go Google it. I can't stop watching it. And so, so uh, my rabbit hole item this week, partly in honor of Heather Berlin, is uh, a Netflix show I've discovered. It's a German show, so you're going to have to read some subtitles. My apologies for that, but it's a really dark, wrought show that I highly recommend called Babylon Berlin on uh, Netflix. So hopefully uh, you can check that out. And then when you're thoroughly depressed, go watch The Cat Lawyer. <laughs> it's the antidote. If you're thoroughly depressed, don't watch Babylon Berlin. <laughs> <laughs> Well, we are really happy to have Heather with us today. She is, um, she was, I think, God, we've had Heather on our stage multiple times because we love her. That's just the answer. We love her. Um, she she was invited to our very first Science and Entertainment Exchange retreat, uh, which I think we have said before, it's our highest form of engagement. Um, and we did a, an early retreat in Arizona, which we were not quite sure whether it would be a complete flop, but Heather was willing to take the chance on us. And we knew we weren't taking a chance on her, but she was willing to take a chance on us and 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 try a little bit of an experiment. Um, and I think that the the thing that I would say about Heather is that after a second retreat, because she did come back for more, we went to a a, a separate subsequent meeting, not an exchange meeting. And she and I were so so excited about having come off this retreat, but we were supposed to be acting as mentors of a sort to a, a young university student, a nameless university. And this young woman was so 
disgusted by us and our thorough um, unprofessionalism, the disdain was eminent off of this young woman for the two of us. And so I think Heather and I now routinely sign emails to one another in disdain. Um, and yet I have absolutely no disdain for Heather whatsoever. I have only the highest respect for her as a person and for her science. And I think after you hear her presentation and, and, uh, and have the opportunity to listen to her talk because there are very few um, communicators of her caliber. And so we are really, really happy to have her here. So with absolutely no disdain, I now hand this over to you, Heather, and with great appreciation. So thank you so much. Oh, and what an intro. Thank you so much. Um, it's an honor and a pleasure to be here. Uh, I am now going to attempt to share my screen. So hopefully no cat filters show up in the process. Um, so give me a minute. Share. And this is the technical part of the Okay, hold on. And I think we should have it now. Do you all see that? Good, thumbs up. I don't know, I can't see anybody. So I'm hoping the answer is yes. Um, so thanks for having me here. Um, so my first question is, did you plan to attend this talk in advance or did you decide at the last minute? Um, and it's answers to questions like these that can actually tell me a lot about your brain. You know, for instance, what did you have for breakfast this morning? Did you have oatmeal with no sweetener or did you have a donut? And, you know, we make these micro decisions multiple times a day. Um, but their consequences, especially now in this digital age that we're living in, can have, you know, disproportionate consequences. Um, so this age old question that we go through, some of us do at least a few times a day to tweet or not to tweet, you know, uh, so it, it can make a huge difference in some people's lives in this in the social media culture that we live in, the difference between impulse control now versus five minutes from now can change a person's career can ruin a relationship. So some people on this spectrum of impulse control have very low Im impulse control and that can manifest in things like angry outbursts, um, emotional dysregulation, reckless behavior, uh, you know, high fatty food diet, infidelity, pathological gambling, shopping, video game addiction, social media addiction. Um, but other people control too much. And that's the other end of the spectrum, overly controlled people that can lead to frustration, anxiety, um, engaging in repetitive behaviors like washing hands multiple times a day or triple checking everything. So even the need to be in control can itself spiral out of control. So I've spent a large part of my career studying and treating people with these impulsive and compulsive disorders. But you don't need to have a disorder to have issues with impulse control. And I think everybody has something that they wish that they can gain more control over. And I want you to now just think about whatever your own guilty pleasure is, um, mine is chocolate, um, and, and how much control do you really have over it? So... This is uh, Baba Brinkman, who was the rapper who you heard at the beginning when you were signing on. And yes, he is my husband. We have two children. But sometimes I ask myself, or others ask, how did this happen? How did you end up with a science rapper? Um, and I often say, well, it was with a little help from my unconscious biological impulses. Uh, we met in September of 2012. I was giving a kind of... Um, TED type talk at this underground venue in New York City. And he was my opening act. And right after I finished my talk, he came up to me, came straight up to me and said, I loved your talk. What's your situation? Are you single? Can I get your number? And, you know, I thought it was a bit impulsive of him, but I appreciated his directness. So I decided to go out with him. Um, but my conscious mind and my girlfriends were saying, what? You're going out with a rapper named Baba? Um, and so my friends were telling me I was being impulsive, but something was attracting me to him. It was something in my brain. Um, and now we're starting to understand a lot about the neurobiology of love, desire, um, these unconscious processes that drive us. And we often make 
sometimes what seem like irrational decisions. We have our sort of conscious parts of our brain, the prefrontal cortex telling us no, but these unconscious drives um, that are saying yes, yes, yes. So whether these decisions are adaptive or not, only time will tell. In my case, I think it works with my two children, but for others, it can get them into trouble. And so I became very curious as to what's uh, the neural basis of these unconscious processes that are driving our behaviors. And, you know, even every conscious thought, every feeling, every perception, everything is encoded in this brain. You can think of it like an information processing machine made up of these individual units or neurons. We have about 86 to 100 billion neurons in the human brain. Each one has about a 1,000 to 10,000 connections or synapses. So there's about 100 trillion connections in the human brain, which is more connections in the brain than there are stars in the Milky Way. So it's, it's quite a complex um, piece of matter. But most of what's happening in our brain is happening outside of awareness. We're only aware of very little um, bit of, of what's happening. And it's a myth we only use 10% of our brain. We actually use all of our brain. Um, but we're only consciously aware of a very little bit of, of what's happening. And so, you know, in studies, we can dig a little deeper to try to understand these unconscious drives that are pushing us fo uh, uh, forward um, or having us avoid, let's say, immediate pain. Um, sometimes we can give people tasks that show them stimuli subliminally. So they'll be flashed on a screen very quickly. Somebody claims not to see anything. In this experiment, they either showed people subliminally this bad boy throwing a cake or a good boy presenting a cake. And then they would show superliminally or consciously this neutral image of a boy. And at, the, the participants were asked to describe him in terms of adjectives. And sure enough, if they had unconsciously seen the bad boy, they would describe him with more negative traits than if they saw the good boy unconsciously. So this information is getting in and there's a whole array of studies which demonstrate this. It's through the olfactory realm as well. Like sometimes when they had lemon cleaner in the room, people were more likely to clean up their crumbs after themselves if they were given cookies. If it was a uh, competitive task, if there was a briefcase in sight, people would be more likely to behave competitively. So throughout our day, the, these, these stimuli are getting into our brain. Our brain can only process so much consciously. So most of it is being processed unconsciously and affecting um, how we behave. This was a cover of Parents magazine that came out a few years ago. And I don't know if you can see, nobody caught the message that was being portrayed in the title, if you pick up on that. Um, but again, it might have gone on to affect people's behavior in strange ways. Uh, and interesting enough, we also see that um, people can be motivated by money um, without even being consciously aware of it. In this study, they put people in a scanner to look at brain activation in real time. They showed them either a picture of a pound or a penny and said, squeeze a grip. And the harder they squeeze, the more of the money they can win. And sure enough, when they showed the pound, they would squeeze harder. They were more motivated. But then they presented those stimuli unconsciously and they were told to squeeze this grip anyway. And sure enough, they squeezed harder for the unconsciously presented pounds than the penny. And when they looked at what was happening in their brain, they found that even when it was presented unconsciously, it was activating these subcortical evolutionarily older parts of the brain involved in reward. So there's these bottom up process where these, these older parts of our brain are being stimulated. And only after the fact are the more uh, conscious parts of the brain, like the prefrontal cortex aware of why we're behaving the way we are. So kind of like to break the brain down into these two um, basic systems, one of which is the limbic system, which uh, is this, again, reptilian brain, evolutionarily older. It's, it's sensitive to immediate pleasure and avoidance of pain. Uh, the amygdala is, is a part of that brain, that, uh, of the, that system that is um, sensitive to emotional signals. Um, and I kind of liken it to like the Keith Richards inside of your head, you know, just give me, give me all the, you know, sex, drugs, rock and roll. And then you have the more recently evolved prefrontal cortex that is more deliberative. It thinks about the future consequences of your actions. Um, and that's the kind of break system of the brain. Um, I liken it to our governor in the fine state of New York, Cuomo, organized, structured, planning ahead. Um, now, when these two systems are in balance, we make adaptive decisions. But if there's too much overdrive, let's say from the limbic system, like the, the you're stepping on the gas, it's going to override the brake. Or if the brake system, the prefrontal cortex is broken, these two systems can get out of balance and we can make maladaptive decisions. And this could lead to impulse control disorders. Um, also, if the connections between these two systems are faulty, we can also have uh, trouble withholding, responding, 
um, because of some future consequence. And we can see that across the board. Um, when we even have people in a scanner and they're simply imagining an aggressive scenario versus a neutral scenario, you see that they have deactivation of parts of their prefrontal cortex, simply imagining aggression. And you can think about this when you, when you, you know, think about mob mentality, um, when you're in an environment like that, is parts of your prefrontal cortex can, can shut down and can allow you to kind of be in these, these states almost, um, uh, you lose your sense of self uh, and, and impulses can take over. And the, the first very famous case that was the foundation for the idea that the, frontal, um, the prefrontal cortex was involved in impulse control was Phineas Gage. He was uh, working on the railroad in the 1800s. There was this piece of dynamite. There was a little bit of an explosion of a spark and this tamping iron went straight through his prefrontal cortex. And he changed from being a mild mannered man to being impulsive and aggressive. Um, and that was the foundation of the idea that, that basically we can start looking at the brain, um, looking at when things go wrong to try to understand how it's working the rest of the time when we take it for granted. And this is a more modern case of Phineas Gage, where this is a, a patient that, this was in about 2003, he started developing pedophilia symptoms um, late in life, which was unusual. Um, and he was going to be sentenced. And the night before he checked himself into a hospital and because he was having severe headaches, they did an MRI and they found this large tumor in his orbital prefrontal cortex, the part of the brain involved in impulse control. And he even said the pleasure principle overrode. He couldn't control himself. And they removed the tumor and sure enough, the symptoms went away. About a year later, the symptoms came back and sure enough, the tumor had grown back. So, you know, a lot of neuroscience is about correlation, showing that a particular brain region is active during a certain thought or behavior um, using neuroimaging. But this is really getting at causation, right? Brain changes um, that are directly causing changes in personality. And it's not just when we can see a lesion in the head directly. Um, we, there's also more subtle variations when we look at psychiatric illness. So another condition that I study that's associated with impulse control problems is borderline personality disorder. And um, the classic case is, it's probably an old reference by now, um, <clears throat> Glenn Close and Fatal Attraction, where there was Winona Ryder in the film Girl Interrupted. Um, and this is um, people who have unstable self-image or relationships, uh, instability in terms of their emotions. They're very reckless. They have like reckless spending, driving, sexual behavior, substance abuse, self-harm. Um, and But the thing is with the psychiatric patient, there's no clear hole in the head, right? You can't point to something and say, that's where the problem is. That's where the lesion is. So in one study, what I did is I compared these patients to patients who had these precise lesions in their orbital prefrontal cortex on a whole variety of measures. And what I found is that orbital frontal cortex or prefrontal cortex dysfunction is what is driving the impulsive behaviors in these borderline patients. And what that means is that interventions for certain psychiatric illnesses can now be targeted directly at the brain circuitry that modulates the core symptoms of the disorder rather than the overall disorder itself, which can be a very heterogeneous or a mixed category. So I think, you know, the more we understand about how the brain works, the better we can treat disorders of, of impulsivity. But again, we all fall somewhere on this range of either risk averse um, or impulsive or sort of attracted to risk. And actually, you know, when I first met Baba, um, he reminded me of one of my impulse control disorder patients because he presented with caffeine addiction, alcohol overuse, high fat diet, lack of exercise and screen addiction. I, I hope you're watching this, honey. Um, but with proper incentives, I managed to help motivate him to modulate his impulsive behaviors. And now he's a perfectly well-oiled machine. Um, but no, I, I tend to be more on the risk averse side of things and, you know, he, he might say I'm over controlled, but I don't think that's true. I think he's just under controlled. Um, but if you, we all fall somewhere on this spectrum. And then if you take it to the extremes, you can map out different psychiatric illnesses. So on the risk aversion side, you have things like obsessive compulsive disorder, um, anorexia, depression. On the impulsive side, you have antisocial personality disorder, borderline personality disorder, pathological gambling. I often wanted to throw in this I think applause addiction or being that, that should get thrown in somewhere at some point, but some people are addicted. They need the adulation. They need to be on stage over everything else. And that can be just as um, 
motivating as some of these other things like shopping addictions or internet addictions. Um, but something that's very much involved, it's not just different parts of the brain, but there's also neurochemistry. And the dopaminergic system um, of the brain is, is very much involved in impulse control. There's these different neural pathways. You have the mesocortical. They basically start in the brainstem. Um, you have these brainstem nuclei, nuclei that bathe the brain in dopamine along these different paths. Um, the one that, that I think is most interesting for the purposes of impulse control um, is this mesolimbic path, which feeds dopamine um, into the nucleus accumbens, which some call is like the reward center of the brain. And in rats, when we, um, there's experiments where you can implant uh, these stimulators directly into that pathway, and then the rat can press a lever and directly stimulate that pathway. Um, and then you give it a choice. You can either, they can either press the lever and get that direct uh, reward stimulation, or they can have water if they're water deprived. Um, they'll choose the, the direct stimulation. They'll choose it over food if they're food deprived, sex if they're sex deprived. They'll keep pressing that until the point of exhaustion. So you can see how these pathways are involved in drugs of addiction. And in fact, um, there is this theory of addiction called the incentive sensitization theory of addiction, which says that there are these two pathways. You have a liking dopaminergic pathway of, of sort of getting pleasure out of something and the wanting or the kind of seeking behavior of something. And when you first try a drug, liking it and wanting it are about equal. But over time, you start to like it less, you get less pleasure out of it, but the desire for it keeps increasing. And this is what we see in this addiction cycle. The other thing that's important to keep in mind is something called ego depletion. So it's the idea that self-control can actually, um, is a limited resource. And the more you use it, the less of it you have. So if you're constantly being controlled in, in certain scenarios, you might have less ability to inhibit yourself in others. And that's how sometimes, uh, sometimes we see people like, for example, Tiger Woods, who's very controlled with playing golf, but then he had this sort of, out of control with, with infidelity. And sometimes you see that in people who are over controlled and kind of need an outlet in other areas. And an interesting study showing that we're all vulnerable um, to this when we're tired, when we're, we're sleep deprived, that we have um, greater difficulty controlling our impulses. So they looked at judges who are making parole decisions. And the default is to say, you know, that we're going to have the status quo and not grant parole. What they found is right after lunch, they would grant parole about 65% of the time. And then that would gradually go down, those favorable rulings would drop very dramatically until about zero just before their next break um, as the judges got more hungry and, and tired. So it, it affects us all. So the next question is, of course, well, then what about free will? I mean, how much control do we really have? And is, according to neuroscience, if we describe free will in terms of if everything inside your brain was exactly the same, you could have done otherwise, then the answer is we don't really have that kind of free will. We call it the Cartesian definition of free will. Um, you, you, there would have to be a ghost in the machine controlling things outside of your neurons. And this brings me to this classic um, experiment by Benjamin Libet, where he had people just look at this little ball going around a um, clock. And he would say, just remember where that is the moment you feel like you wanna move your finger and press this button. And he, he said that moment, even just before you press the button, when you had the intention to press it, is, is called the um, awareness of attention or W right there. And then he looked at brain activation using EEG and found that about 350 milliseconds before the person is even consciously aware of their intention to move, you see a buildup of brain activation. So it's like the brain is starting to decide to make a move before you're even consciously aware of it. Now, people didn't like this, of course, um, this was very controversial. And so then some people said, well, what about free won't? What about in this moment between the point in which you have the intention and when you make the action, you can maybe inhibit or stop yourself. And that's where we have free will. But then another study came out a few years later, which showed that even your decision to inhibit behavior has these neural precursors or precursors leading up to it. So there's no really way to get around it. And then behavioral studies show that actually the more if you tell a person that there is no free will, the more likely they're to act unethically if you give them an exam or to behave more selfishly. So free will as, a, it, as an illusion matters. It affects how we behave. But the next question people often say is, well, then can I just go out and commit a crime and say my, ma my brain made me do it? And the answer is no, um, because even though you don't have free will in that classic Cartesian sense, 
the brain still has the capacity for self-control and society and the law holds people responsible for their actions to the extent that they have the capacity for self-control. And it's an evolved function of the brain that develops over the course of a lifetime. So as you can see here, the prefrontal cortex isn't fully developed until about the age of 25. So that's why we, we would say none of these brains have free will, but we hold the five-year-old less responsible for their actions than the 20-year-old because they do not yet have their brake system fully formed in their brain. And teenagers can be the worst because their limbic system is in overdrive. So their accelerator is on overdrive and the brake isn't fully formed yet. So that's when you get all the fun teenage uh, behavior. But there are also individual differences um, in terms of how much control we, we have. So this classic marshmallow test where um, Walter Michel gave children ages three to six, one marshmallow, and he left the room and said, just wait right here and don't eat the marshmallow. And if you don't eat it, I'll come back and you can have two marshmallows. And then he just filmed them. And as you can see, some were perfectly well behaved and others couldn't handle it and had to eat the one marshmallow. And then he followed these people up uh, uh, throughout their lives and found that this one test um, correlated with, with all of these other um, areas of life success, whether it was job attainment, marital status, um, body mass index. Um, now there's some controversy around this study, but what I think it is, is just a function. It's a, it's a measure of prefrontal cortex function. And that maps onto, for example, you're going to be able to stay home and study instead of going out to that party tonight. And maybe that leads to you getting better grades and then getting a better job. And you can see how this can build up throughout a lifetime. Um, but so even though children don't have that much impulse control as an adult, um, it's also an opportunity because their brains are still forming and there are ways that we can increase our impulse control. So there are things we can all do. Um, if you know what your predilection is, you know, remove it from your environment. Don't leave sweets around the house if you, you know, you are on a diet. If you're trying not to call an ex, you know, remove their number from your phone and tell your friends not to give it to you. Change your environment around you. Um, stop and and think before acting whether it's to breathe be mindful count to 10 whatever it is to you need to do to take a moment to actually re-engage your prefrontal cortex instead of just acting on instinct um, and another another thing you can do is put social pressure on yourself let's say it's to go to the gym let then maybe you have sort of an app that posts when you're at the gym to other people or you you plan to meet a friend at the gym um, but also you know commit to somebody else and that can actually help you stay in line as well. But you can always change your behavior and your brain and mind will follow. Um, everybody has the capacity for change. So while all this is said that, you know, having more control is good, um, being over controlled isn't good. And in some cases, certain forms of letting go in a controlled way can paradoxically increase um, our well-being and our ability for self-control. So again, you don't want to turn off your prefrontal cortex completely because then you could lead to reckless behavior. But if you can do it in a controlled way, it can lead to very positive outcomes. It can be very therapeutic and healthy. Um, like with children, they might not have that much impulse control, but they're also more creative. They can think outside the box. They don't have that filter um, that's been kind of, or all that structure that the adult brain has that can free them. And so one thing that I wanted to look at about how can we turn off the prefrontal cortex in a controlled way that's healthy is to look at creativity, in particular, spontaneous creativity. And what else, what better than freestyle rap? Um, this is a really um, engaging task. You have, to, you have to make up words on the spot. They have to rhyme. They have to stay on beat. Uh, it's a very difficult task. And so I wanted to look at what's happening in a person's brain, for example, when they're freestyle rapping. And luckily, I had a test subject. My husband, Baba, I got him in my fMRI machine. Um, I had him do a memorized rap versus a freestyle rap to look at the difference in brain activation. Uh, the first thing I noticed were two holes um, right here in his socks. I don't know if you can see them. That was, yeah, when we first started dating, I don't know what that was about. Um, and these are some pictures of his brain. This part right here is missing. That's the part that has to do with listening, honey. Um, but this is some results that came from a preliminary study with Lou's group, which found that when freestyle rapping compared to memorized rap, you get a unique pattern of brain activation. You get decreased activation in the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex and increased activation in the medial prefrontal cortex. 
dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex has to do with conforming your behavior to make sure it, um, it goes along with social norms. So what you're doing is sort of letting go. Um, it has to do with your feeling of agency. So it feels like things are flowing through you. Um, and, and it has to do with your inner critic. So the inner critic is kind of turned down. Anything goes, you can make novel associations between ideas. The moment you become too self-aware, too self-conscious, that part of the brain turns on again and you lose the flow. You're outside of that state. And we also, uh, other studies found the same pattern in jazz musicians when they were improvising, again, with that decreased dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex function. So they are, again, letting go, they're outside of themselves. A lot of times artists say it feels like the, the, um, the creativity, it's flowing through them. Um, so I think Eminem had it right when he said you have to lose yourself in the music the moment you own it, you better never let it go. That's my rap. Um, but people really do strive to get to these states. They're very pleasurable. It's where you lose your sense of focus. It's associated with this kind of transcendent experience, very positive emotions. And one thing I'm interested in is, can we find a neural signature of creativity and these flow states across different art forms? And if so, can we help people get there more easily um, and stay there longer? And you don't need to be creative to get to these states. We also see similar brain states when people are under hypnosis, during daydreaming, during certain types of meditation, and even during REM sleep, where you lose your sense of self and time and place. Anything goes. Again, if you're in this state all the time, that would not be healthy. You might be in a state of either impulse control disorder or kind of schizophrenia, but to do it in a controlled way can be very therapeutic. Um, and finally, the last thing I wanna mention is that um, although you don't need drugs to achieve these flow states, we do see similar patterns with certain types of drugs, um, namely psychedelics. So here you can see, this is a pattern of, of brain activation when uh, at the top when uh, during meditation, um, when you have um, certain parts of the prefrontal cortex are deactivated and you see that same pattern with um, people on psilocybin or mushrooms. And when you map out the brain on psilocybin, this is what it looks like on a placebo. This is mapping out the connections and the thicker the line, the stronger the connection and the closer together is the closer together these connections are within the brain. So you have a lot of local connections um, and a few long range connections. And this is what it looks like on psilocybin. So as you can see, it's a much wider repertoire. There's a freer communication pathways in the brain. Um, and, and it kind of lets the anything goes. And again, if you're in this state all the time, it would be maladaptive. But for short periods of time, it can allow, again, novel associations between ideas and creativity. Um, we also see that when using another kind of um, neuroimaging technique called MEG, where you see higher signal diversity on psilocybin, ketamine, LSD, um, which indicates, again, a larger repertoire of physical brain states um, where your senses blend, your ego is dissolved, uh, and sometimes people have these epiphanies. And so now these certain drugs, these psychedelic drugs are being used in what we call psychedelic assisted psychotherapy. So MDMA is being used for treatment of treatment resistant PTSD, ketamine for depression, psilocybin for things like anxiety and end of life issues. And it's really having a significant impact in these controlled environments with a therapist um, in a controlled way. And so, Finally, you know, one reason we think that this, these, these drugs might be very therapeutic is because it allows people to have these transcendent experiences and really be outside of themselves and kind of one with everything and feel this connection with everything. And that's a lot of times with people who have spiritual experiences or feelings of awe, they experience this connection with like a higher being or power. And it's so profound that it can transform them and imbue them with new values or a new mission in life. We see this with astronauts who have the overview effect. They often, um, when they see earth from afar, from this new perspective, it fundamentally changes them for the rest of their life. Um, so I think a spiritual, a transcendent experience, whether it's naturally occurring or with drugs or direct brain stimulation can have these really powerful um, therapeutic effects and they're continuing to be investigated now. Uh, so finally, I think that, you know, our relationship with our impulses can in some ways define who we are. It can either be the source of our ultimate triumphs or of our ruin and our downfall. And by learning how to know yourself and the sources of your impulses and by choosing when and where to set them free and when to rein them in, um, you can become the best version of yourself. And the, the key is really to look inward, to reflect, to bring your unconscious motivations to the surface, into consciousness. That's what psychotherapy tries to do. And this ultimately will allow you to understand yourself better, achieve more of your long-term goals, 
live in harmony with yourself and hopefully find equanimity, which I think um, is the ultimate goal. And I will leave it there. Thanks. Wow, that was incredible. You covered so much. Thank you, Heather. Um, and we've got a bunch of questions. Please uh, go ahead and ask questions, continue to ask questions in the Q&A. Heather, I will do my best to split focus and try to get to as many questions as we can. First, uh, Betts asked, uh, how do sex hormones impact impulse control for you know male and female testosterone and estrogen? Ah, oh, like, it, uh, well, they have different effects. Um, I think there could be a whole lecture on that. Um, I did have a slide in particular about how when people are in love, in the throes of passionate love, I didn't present it now, but how these different hormones can affect um, us in terms of becoming more obsessional, kind of um, doing things we wouldn't otherwise do um, because of, of the loved one. There is a certain genetic component. Um, so this isn't so much male, female, but but there's a, a gene that codes for the um, neurotransmitter, uh, a receptor for the neurotransmitter serotonin. Um, and if you have the short allele for this S1 um, serotonin receptor, you tend to be more impulsive. But I think things like testosterone can be lead more, um, more towards aggression. But this is how I like to put it. Um, I think of antisocial personality disorder is diagnosed more in men and borderline personality disorder is diagnosed more in females about 75% of the time. And they might both be um, they might be both impulse control disorders. They both have problems with their prefrontal cortex, but in one case, interacting with male um, hormones and they lead them to act out impulsively on others, let's say impulsive aggression. And then they end up getting diagnosed with antisocial personality disorder and like go to jail and things. Whereas the women are acting impulsively, but towards themselves, like more introverted self-harm. And, and then they get diagnosed with borderline personality disorder um, so I think that impulsivity can interact with male, female traits in different ways. And then you end up with these different differential diagnoses, but they're the same underlying brain disorder. Sorry, my two-year-old's knocking. Um, so Norbert sort of, I think as a, as a, a on that sort of topic, uh, or an ex extension asks, uh, essentially, what do you think, what place do you think neurological tests have inside of the criminal justice system? Sorry, Norbert, I, I, I paraphrased you. I think that's a really good question. Um, uh, so I think that I'll give you an example of um, who is this, the football player Hernandez, uh, right? Aaron Hernandez, who, who ended up going to jail for murder. Then he actually committed suicide in jail. They looked at his brain um, and they found that he had incredible amounts of, uh, he had CTE and an um, incredible amount of damage in his brain. Now, I think that they should do neurocognitive testing be before sentencing. It's not to say that the person won't be sentenced or they're still not a threat. If they're a threat to society, you know, they need to be um, removed, but I think in how they are then treated after, right? And so maybe they end up going to a maximum security, you know, psychiatric institute where they can get a different kind of treatment than going to prison. But I do think that it could be helpful um, to test everybody before sentencing, just to take that into an account. Not that it's going to give them, um, get them off the hook, but I think it just might help with in terms of how they're treated after. Um, so we have a, a couple of questions. Uh, Andre is the latest to ask it, uh, basically around the idea of how does the age of the, if there's brain damage, how does the age of the person who experiences it uh, affect their ability to adapt? That's, that's a good question. I mean, one of the interesting things with having to do with impulsivity is that our sense of morality um, is it develops over the course of our life. And if you look at like people like Piaget and Kohlberg, they had all these theories of development of morality. Usually you don't, you're not, you don't have the highest levels of morality until around the ages like 10 or so. If you got a brain damage before then, you might never actually learn the rules. You know, you might act out because you don't understand the difference between right and wrong. You get brain damage later in life. Um, you understand the rules. You just can't stop yourself from breaking them because like that pedophilia patient said the pleasure principle overrode. He knew what he was doing is wrong. He just couldn't stop himself. I don't know if that answers the question. Um, but yeah, that's, that's, that's something interesting to point out in terms of how it relates to impulse control. How about uh, nature versus nurture, you know, uh, especially if you have, a, you know, a, a condition that might steer you one way, how much can like your, your parents impact? Mm. You know, I think uh, 
I often actually argue with my husband about this a lot because a lot of research shows that parenting doesn't make a huge difference unless it's at the extreme. So if it's like very severe, you know, abuse or neglect, then it has like a big impact. Um, but in general, it doesn't have as much of an impact and, and your, your genes and your and peer group really has an effect um, in terms of, you know, the um, nurture part of it. Um, but, but I think that what I like to say is that the, our, we have these biological constraints that will put us within a certain range. Those are like the high and the low within a range. And then the environment can push us either to the highest level or the lowest level within our range. So if you're an anxious person, you know, let's say with, with good parenting and with therapy, you might become less anxious, but you'll never be like the most relaxed laid back person. Cause that's just not in your biological makeup. Uh, that last question was from Candy. Uh, this one, Susan and Ted both asked about specific conditions, uh, ADD, ADHD, OCD, and bipolar uh, were the four. Do you care to comment on any of them? Do you have any thoughts on any of them in impulse control? So it was ADD, ADHD, OCD, and bipolar. Um, That's right. So, you know, I think what's interesting with, with ADD or, or ADHD is that what people often find interesting is that it's counterintuitive that as a treatment, we give them a stimulant, right? Like basically methylphenidate. Um, and what it's, what's interesting though, is that it's stimulating the neurons that are in, that are mostly in the prefrontal cortex. So it's actually like turning the brake system on. That's what the stimulant does. And so that in a way helps you calm down. So it seems a bit counterintuitive. And, and that dopaminergic system, one of them that I, I showed um, in that image, it was that yellow track that goes into the prefrontal cortex is what's really being affected um, with ADHD. Um, OCD is interesting. It's almost like the opposite. So with like the impulse control disorders or ADD, you have decreased activation of the prefrontal cortex. With OCD, you have overactivation of the prefrontal cortex. It's on too high, um, and you know you need to figure out ways how to like kind of calm it, calm it down. Um, bipolar is in a different category, so I guess I will, I'm not going to throw that into the impulse control. But but there is you know you have these manic episodes where you are acting out impulsively when you're in the manic episode um, versus the other. But I think it's too much to get into all the nuances with that now. Okay, uh, Tasha and Ted both asked a version of, you know, are video games and smartphones and sort of this, uh, you know, uh, short attention span culture that our kids are being raised in, how's that affecting impulse control? Yeah, um, I think that it is creating a shorter attention span um, in children. And the, <clears throat> the other side is that they are it's not all negative. They are getting better at shifting tasks very quickly. They are, you know, there's certain things where they, they are better at um, taking in a lot of information and synthesizing it very quickly and kind of getting the point um, quicker. Uh, so <clears throat> there are trade-offs, I think. Um, obviously, I it's become harder to sit down and have the attention span to say, read a book. Um, but that's not to say that you can't do it. I think the biggest problem, the downside with all of the um, technology in children is that it's taking away from their actual face-to-face -face interactions in critical periods of development when evolutionarily speaking, they're meant to learn about subtle social cues and they're, they're missing out on that. And I think that's the, the most crucial aspect outside of the like short attention span, which I think you can work on, but the, the social interactions and the nuances are harder, especially when you miss these critical periods of development. I imagine the pandemic's not helping much with that either. No, not at all. <laughs> so Hillary and Daniel basically asked a similar questions. I'm going to add a little coda onto it. The question is, do you have any other strategies? I know you mentioned a few in the talk, but for sort of controlling or letting go with respect to impulse control and also what are, this is my coda, uh, how do you, uh, what are strategies you have with your own kids? Um, so there's both with kids and then with uh, myself. Um, so some tips about actually letting go. Certain people, I think, have a more difficult time letting go. Um, and some people it comes naturally to like artists and whatnot, others who are more constrained. And so or if you're trying to be creative and, and are stuck, the best thing you can do is go for a walk, do something else. Like don't think about the thing. 
Um, let your mind be free daydream. You know, like you come up with your best ideas in the shower. It's when you're not trying, um, like don't try to let go, just do something and let your mind wander. And that's the, the most you need to do. Um, of course, some people have things they know they have go-to things like they know when they go rock climbing or play tennis, they get into these flow states. But if you don't know what yours is, just go for a walk. Just, you know, um, don't try so hard. In terms of, let's see, with children, oh, what are my strategies with children in terms of what, controlling their behavior or what is the question here? I guess, I guess, yeah, help, help well, helping them learn impulse control versus when, oh. you know, yeah. Um, well, you know, okay, so there are a couple of good um, books out there and shows for kids um, that we often then refer to. I'm just going to, it depends on the age of the kid, but like my kids are young. So Daniel Tiger has a good a couple of good things, but there's little mantras that I have with my kids, but we'll, I'll have them like, they'll get riled up and I'll say, okay, stop. We're going to meditate. They're not really meditating, but we do this thing where we close our eyes and we sit like, you know, legs crossed and we go like this for, you know, a few seconds even, but it's just enough to get them to distract them into another kind of brain state. So, you know, and the, the good thing about kids is they have very short attention span. So you can play around with that. Like if they are very upset about something, sometimes you're just like, oh, hey, look at this shiny object over here. And it's enough to kind of switch them out of that mode and get them into another place where they can maybe calm until their feelings kind of calm down a bit if they're riled up. There's very, very different strategies, but I can go on and on. <laughs> Yeah. You know, I'm, I'm trying to decide if you answered this question or if it's a good segue. Kate is asking about the practice of meditation over time. So, you know, how, how do you do you, you didn't, I don't think you went into that much in the talk. Like, how should adults utilize meditation? In your opinion? You know, I think that it doesn't have to be like where you, I mean, yes, great. If you set out a period of time each day and you're like, this is my 20 minute meditation. And, and I mean, that's lovely and wonderful or use an app, but it doesn't even have to be as complex as that. I think it's just any moment that you're in being mindful of the moment you're in. The example that I use is if you're in, if you're watching a movie and you're eating popcorn and all of a sudden you look down and the popcorn's gone, that was mindless, right? You weren't being mindful of that. But if you are like eating and like each kernel, you're looking, you're smelling, you're tasting, you're being aware of all your senses around you, like in the moment, you're feeling grounded in this moment. And that's all that matters. Like bringing your attention to the moment, being mindful in each moment that you can throughout the day um, can really just help get your mind into these states. So it doesn't have to be always a designated set amount of time. We don't all have that. I don't have 20 minutes to go. I wish I did, you know, to meditate each day, but I do try to take certain times throughout the day to just be present, be mindful. So uh, Joshua is asking about um, book recommendations um, for, for people who are interested in the topic to learn more. Hmm. Well, I, <laughs> now that you mentioned, oh, is that the segue? <laughs> well, come on, I gave you that one, Heather. You gave me that one. Um, I am actually working on a book right now. It's in the very early stages. It will be with Simon and Schuster published. So I would keep an eye out for that book. Um, I'm going to say next year, um, but I'm working on it now and it'll be all the things I talked about plus more. Um, so stay tuned. Now, how about works of fiction though? Uh, are there novels that you'd recommend that are interesting portrayals? I know you, you pointed out a couple movies. I am super into to, to films. I'm trying to think of a novel that's, a portrayal of impulse control. I mean, there's so many, I feel like you can find it in, in anything. Um, I'm trying to think about what my favorite would be. I don't know, it's hard, you know, I'm, I'm for some reason, this is just popping into my mind right now, but um, Oscar Wilde's the, what is it, the port picture of Dorian Gray? Um, you know, <laughs> for some reason, I just, because this idea of capturing like youth and you know all that comes with it and this kind of desire um, um, and and how to overcome that we all have that within us you know we want like the satisfaction immediate pleasures now and and how do we you know as we need to kind of step back and think about the long term consequences of our actions I don't know why that book is coming to my mind it's a book that I love. Yeah. Uh, I think we have time for probably one, possibly two more questions. Uh, I'm going to read Mark's because uh, it's pretty specific. What role do the left and right cortical networks play, especially with the left inhibiting right or right offering alternative creative uh, perceptions and ideas along with frontal and limbic? Okay. 
this is great because then I can debunk a myth. So the whole left brain, right brain thing is kind of no longer a thing. Um, it's not like left brain is logical and right brain is creative. It's more like different neural pathways, different neural circuits. So there's something called the default mode network, which is that kind of when you're just like thinking into in yourself, like you're daydreaming and whatnot. The, the, the creativity kind of network that I talked about when people are improvising, it's not left or right. It's just different parts of, let's say, the prefrontal cortex and some subcortical regions that are active versus being in a different brain state. So I think of them as different brain states rather than left versus right. That being said, there's still some what we call lateralization, like language tends to be on the left. Um, you know, there are there's are certain things that are lateralized, but with a kind of creativity, it's no longer that. It's just different neural networks. Um, okay, Akisha is going to be our last question. I hope I pronounced your name right. Apologies if I mis mis said it. Uh, what hormones are involved with impulsive disorders, and is this treatment used? Is there a treatment used to balance them? Uh, I wouldn't say it's so much hormones as it's um, neurotransmitters. So, like, uh, but but I would so it tends to be SSRIs. So drugs that affect the serotonin system. And like I said before, you know, we see that the certain um, people that short allele for this, uh, that codes for a serotonin receptor tend to be more impulsive. Um, that's kind of the, the mainstream treatment right now. There's no kind of magic bullet, unfortunately, with psychiatry. Um, but I think cognitive behavioral therapy uh, tends to be the best. And, you know, people can really work at it and, and, get better. I mean, they're, again, they might not be the most, you know, controlled person, but if you, you know what your predilections are and you really work towards um, modulating them um, with whatever incentives, whether internal or external, you can, it can really help. Yeah. You know what? I lied. I think we've got time for one more. How about dementia? How does dementia Great. Affect Um, so it depends on the type, there's many different types of dementia. Um, but if you're thinking about, let's say frontal temporal dementia, those people tend to have um, less impulse control, but you know, just aging in general, the aging brain, even without throwing dementia in there, which is dementia is just kind of an accelerated aging of the brain, but any aging brain, you tend to have some decreased, you know, decreases in gray matter in the prefrontal cortex. And so if you notice like, very older people can sometimes be a little bit inappropriate or, you know, say things or be blunt. And I often just um, and I give them the benefit of the doubt, you know, like they maybe wouldn't have been that way 30 years ago, but they have an aging brain. So if they might say something inappropriate or act a little inappropriate, like, you know, don't be so hard on them. Wow. That's, yeah, that's practical advice. I think. What's that? <laughs> That's some practical advice, yeah, right? Wow. <laughs> uh, um, well, Heather, this was amazing. And to everybody in the audience, we had over 70, like looks like 77 questions. We got to as many as we could. Um, it's my fault if we didn't get to your question, my apologies, but uh, they were great, great questions. And Heather, thank you for a terrific talk. I can see Anne. Yeah, we are always grateful when you are on our stage, including a virtual one. And so thank you so much, Heather. We're gonna let you scramble on over to um, our second Q&A. And in the meantime, thank all of you for being here. We hope you will come back next week. Uh, we will have a really interesting conversation. I guess, what are we calling it, Rick? The science of- Attraction. Attraction, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So post Valentine's Day. Um, so come back to us uh, and uh, we'll send out an invitation shortly and we hope to see you then. Yeah, thanks everybody. Great questions. Thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs>